What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. Wanted to thank you guys again for helping us hit a milestone last year. And that was two and a half million plays across YouTube and all the podcast apps out there. And it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for you guys. All the support, the questions, the suggestions for shows that you have is amazing. And there's a lot of really cool things and, and topics we're able to cover because of you. So I wanted to thank you for that. And then also this week, we had some Instagram stories. We're going to have an attorney on that deals with the EPA all the time and wanted to know what kind of emissions questions you have. It's a real hot button topic right now with some recent developments. We wanted to thank you guys for the really insightful questions. And we're going to get as many of those questions onto the podcast as possible. So it's going to be dropping here pretty soon. So keep your eye out for it. Today's episode comes directly from Instagram, and we had um, a couple brothers message into us. They said, hey, we've got this 1958 Chevy Viking. We did a 12-valve swap on it, NV4500. There's a ton of custom parts we've had to make because there is no swap kit for it. We think your audience would love it. And so today I'm going to sit down, chat with them, talk about the build, how they've been able to encompass their goals with it, with having to make custom parts, and then just what their impression is of trying to make a you know custom vehicle with a 12 valve Cummins in it and they don't work in the diesel industry they they work in something else and just what how, how they would compare it to what they do and there's going to be some uh, really good insights that they're going to be able to give all right let's get to the podcast chatting about this 1958 chevy viking with a 12 valve swap hey guys welcome to the diesel podcast it's uh it's great to chat with you i appreciate you messaging in on instagram and telling us about this build that you got so i'm excited to get started we're kicking off you know this this new thing on youtube with a video and you guys got the truck in the background so this is gonna be fun oh yeah thanks for having us i'm lars this is sven and i gotta get the door with uh, I, that. <laughs> I love Sorry. that garage yeah it's a nice it's definitely a nice spot we got the lift too which is super handy there's uh there's plenty of space for fun activities i can see oh yeah yeah and we got the tv <laughs> on the wall and i messed that up i'm sorry about that patrick my little brother was knocking oh we're gonna keep rolling just okay. as it goes <laughs> All right. so, so i wanted to start with you know we we chatted a little bit before the podcast you guys were telling me how much into automobiles you are trucks and just everything where did that start for you guys where did you get the passion for automotive motorsports so i know for myself um Sven probably too. From a young age, um, my dad was obsessed with muscle cars, uh, anything with an engine. And uh, at a very young age, he would take us around to every car show that was in the area. He'd buy every car magazine that he could get. Um, the Rat Fink posters on the wall, the old Chevy posters on the wall. Um, so just, you know, being around him in that entire car culture just really like uh embedded it in our blood to you know muscle cars fast engines so you yeah. guys are she you guys are chevy guys yeah we're big we're big chevy guys but we honestly like anything that has wheels and a big engine um i know for myself like lars said our dad brought us up with the chevys the hot rods but we also uh work for a manufacturer a uh, american-made manufacturer so we have a lot of pride in american-made stuff and you know, those 70s Chevelles and those old muscle cars kind of drive that home, that pride of your work and, you know, the country and what this country can make and that kind of thing. So um, that's kind of where it all started from. And that's kind of how we got into the builds, too, is we had this this passion for working with our hands and building this, uh, building anything with metal, kind of. And, you anyway. know, doing, doing the resto mod, especially like the 58 behind us. Yeah. I think it really stems from those rat fink drawings, you know, those Ed Roth drawings, you know, with the uh, with the muscle cars that are just totally blown out of proportion, the flames, the smoke, the big fat guy sticking out, the wheels that aren't supposed to be on the car, the engine that's not supposed to be in the car. Just that whole that whole scene just sticks with us and it really, really pushes us forward and really makes our wheels turn. Well, I know when I first jumped on your guys' Instagram and I saw that truck, I thought, man, you've got to really be passionate to, you know, what your guys' plans were and all the things that you had to do with it. 
That's a, that's a big project. And I, I wanted to start with the, the truck itself and, and how it converged with your passion for motorsports is how did you guys pick that truck? What caught your eye about it? Well, I think I was on uh, Hemmings one day. I don't know if you've been on Hemmings. I have it. Um, so you can like look at classifieds and whatnot. It's kind of like Craigslist, but it's a high end okay. Craigslist almost. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm always looking. So I was on Hemmings and I, I obviously clicked on Chevy. And then uh, one of the filters was Viking. And I said, hey, what the heck is that? So I clicked on Viking and this big beast of a truck showed up and I sent it to my brother. Um, and I think from there you found a Craigslist ad. Yeah, from there it was like instant. Uh, we're Swedish. Uh, so Vikings, everything, Vikings, Swedish, Nordic, just it's home with us. I'm 6'7", 260 pounds. How tall are you? Six. Three, We're six, four. A family full of big boys. So, you know, Viking fits the name here. So originally what had happened to a little backstory was we wanted to do a diesel swap, four wheel drive, um, big, bad truck. And we had bought a 75 C30 in Oregon from eBay. We got it here. We had all the plans. We got all the LMC parts to fix it up. We had all the plans to do it. And it's kind of when that whole square body error took on about four years ago was really starting to take off. And we saw on Instagram that a lot of these guys had done that already. So we were like, I don't know, let's try to find something else. He sent me the, the, the listing. I don't even know if it was, let's try to find something else. He just found it, sent it to me. Found it. I think maybe a week later, I found a Craigslist ad for this guy, Skyler in Nebraska. He was selling his grandpa's old farm truck, which is sitting right behind us. And I haggled him down to 500 bucks and it got here and it's solid as a rock. <laughs> Best 500 bucks we've ever spent. Yeah. <laughs> and when you were thinking about, you know, you get the truck there. Did you have a plan beforehand of, Hey, this is what we want to do with the engine, the powertrain suspension, or how did you, how did you put the build together? Uh, I think it's always changing. So when we first got it, we were, I think we were originally going to leave it two wheel drive and then we found an axle on Craigslist and we said, all right, we'll swap it. And then, um, we started building the rear end with the airbags, uh, and we were going to leave the front with the leaf springs on it. And then we got done building the rear end and we were like, all right, let's, uh, let's do something crazy up front too. But the initial plans for the engine were to just leave it stock Cummins with a HE 351 um and just you know cruise around with it but um i think the pandemic hit and we were sitting there looking at the engine and we were kind of bored and we were like all right let's do compounds <laughs> we have to do compounds this thing's huge it needs to have a big engine yeah um and then from there what else did we get i don't know power driven diesel was doing that giveaway at the time oh, about a month true. ago for the triple turbo oh, 12 yeah ball. yeah i remember that so we were like let's buy as much shit as we possibly can yeah and build the engine but Maybe we'll have a really high chance of winning another truck. <laughs> but I think we always had a plan to do a, a four-wheel drive suspension yeah. truck because our really good friend, Mike Courier, up in Maine has loved trucks. I mean, that's who got us into diesel trucks was our friend, Mike. Um, he was doing a, what year power wagon? A 57, I think. A 57. So he did a 57 with a 12 valve and an HE 351, all parallel four link radius arm setup coilovers and that's just what kind of really hit it home for us that we were like yeah we need to do something totally rad like that he's got a mean truck so we were like we got to do that and like sven said the powertrain was originally going to stay stock just with an he 351 and you know the windshield wiper broke so we had to do the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> better upgrade the the fueling the turbos everything yeah, just goes yeah. <laughs> now, you yeah, guys got to yeah. You guys have a 12 valve in there, right? Yes. Now with the, the fueling and the upgrades, what did you guys do when you were trying to win that truck from the power driven diesel <laughs> giveaway? So I think we started with a, um, an S three 72 S X E, um, with a T three housing. And I think it's a 1.1 AR. Um, so we got that and then we got delivery valves. I think they're what? Oh, 25 delivery valves. Yeah. And then we got injectors, five by, I want to say 16. Yep, five by 16 BCO injectors. Yep, five by 16s. And then we got larger um, 
fuel lines, the fuel rail lines, or uh, what is it? injection lines? Sorry, yeah, injection injection lines. lines. And then we we actually upgraded the head, so we got power driven diesels, ported head, and we have their 178, 208 cam as well, their towing cam. Um, I think that's it for speed, speed manifold. Yes, I mean, that's manifold. just pretty boy parts. That's cool guy parts. But we haven't really done anything to the pump um, in terms of upgrades, uh, or besides like Governor Springs and the the basics. Um, not yet, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's again, it's still not running. So we still have to put our head on, and we still have to finish up our turbo piping. We have some turbo piping laying right there on the on the back, but um, it's not complete. So. Uh, was, it might change down the road. I mean, we have head studs as well. Um, Josh, when we were doing it, shout out to Josh, was yeah. like, was like, you know, if you're doing the turbo, I'm a big fan of just doing everything at once. And Sven was kind of hesitant, but then I was like, we might as well do it. Yeah. The truck's sitting here, yeah. we're waiting. You know, we want the power. Um, yeah, and so the head went on sale, and then I was like, <laughs> all right, that's it's time right now. It's on sale, ten percent <laughs> off, baby. Let's go. <laughs> And then I think we got all new bearings too for the bottom end. So we're going to replace uh, crank bearings and rod bearings and that kind of thing. Now, how hard was it to get the engine into the the, the chassis and just fit it in there? I saw some pictures with some yeah. things outlined where you guys had to do some cutting and some other right. stuff. At yeah. first, it was really easy. Yeah. At first, we put it in with a forklift and we were like, this is it. This is easy. We don't need to cut the firewall, <laughs> nothing. And then we started doing measurements. And then Sven got the yeah. four-wheel drive axle and everything had to go back. Everything needed to move and the cab needed to move. So it turned into a little hole that I, I have the cutouts right over there. It started with a very small hole, probably 12 inches wide. And now it's a big hole that I yeah. can fit my whole body through. <laughs> and then we need, uh, we need the clearance for the downpipe too, for the turbos. That was another hole. Stuff. The the fifty eight the um the only difference between the Viking and the what is it the Spartan yeah the Spartan no, or the no what's the small one the Apache oh the other Apache so the only difference is the front fenders our front fenders are wider so it it looks huge from the outside but really the inside it's like we have these huge inner fender wells so the inside engine compartment is really small and tight. Um, so it was a challenge getting it all to fit, but right now it fits. Uh, we'll see how it goes. We still have to weld up a dog house and a transmission, um, tunnel, but yeah, it was, it was definitely a lot of fun, but it, that truck was not made to fit a Cummins. <laughs> I was not having fun chopping it up. I'm a, yeah. I'm a severe purist. So like whenever he starts cutting and grinding stuff, I'm like, Dude, you gotta you gotta take it easy. Seriously, you gotta. I'm huge. I want to be able to extend yeah. myself in this truck and enjoy myself. But yeah. then again, it's also not a come and swap if cylinder five and six are not in your cab. <laughs> so, now with with tackling that, did you guys just jump in, or, or were there any places that you were able to find help or guidance, or was it just take it step by step and? Yeah. So uh, our big, our friend, Mike Courier up in Maine, again, same guy, uh, him and I are always bouncing ideas off each other. Um, I'll help him out. He'll help me out. So uh, he gave us a lot of guidance, but when it came time to cutting, it was just, all right, where's the whiz wheel? Let's, let's go to town. Um, and for the most part, we just tried to center our, um, our engine mounts over the front axle. And then once that was lined up, we could kind of just guide it in and center it between the frame rails. Um, but it was pretty straightforward once once we, I guess, got it in place and knew where we had to cut the firewall. And with making, uh, now getting those parts, did you guys make those, like motor mounts and all that kind of stuff? Um, the motor mounts, I think if I were to do it again, I would remake motor mounts. Um, but I purchased them from Diesel Conversion Specialists. And they're made for like a 79 Ford F-250 or something like that. Come and swap. Yeah, come and swap. So it bolts up to the engine, but it actually spaces the mounting holes, I think, 31 and a half inches apart. Okay. Um, and our, our frame rail is a standard 34-inch outside dimension frame rail, like the, like the new 450 box trucks or whatever. So now I'm we were able to make it work. I'm starting to think about the 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 transmission and 
making it four wheel drive, what'd you guys pick to put behind that 12 valve? Yeah. So we, um, the guy we purchased the engine from, and I think, where was it? Mass? Yeah. I'm sure somewhere. Yeah. He had um, an NV4500 with an MPT or MP205. Uh, so he had all the good parts to put in it and he was selling them all at once. He was going to do a come and swap in a Jeep himself, but he couldn't get around to doing it. So he sold them all to me. Um, and that's kind of just how we ended up with those parts. And the transfer case is a passenger side drop. Um, and that's kind of our biggest headache because mounting the track bar for the front axle and the radius arm setup was a big pain because that differential is in the way on the passenger side. There's not a lot of uh, axle tube to mount any of those mounts to. So it's really congested. So again, if I were doing it again, I would change those motor mounts and I would change um, from passenger side drop to driver side drop. But again, like I said, I'm a purist. He's a little bit of a purist. The passenger side drop meant a lot to us because on the old K5s and K10s and stuff like that, all Chevys had a passenger side drop. So having a passenger side drop on the truck meant a lot yeah. to us just because it, it stays true to what, what the Chevy is with that passenger side drop. I mean, it's definitely easier to do a uh, do a driver's side drop, but the, the real Chevy purists will look at it and say, hey, it's a passenger side drop. <laughs> but they won't look at it and say, hey, that must have been a – Big pain in the ass. <laughs> well, that's what's so cool about this build and what intrigued me with it is how it's classic, but then also how custom it is. And and a lot of times people reach out to us and they'll say, hey, I've got this, uh, this conversion or this project I'm working on, but I've never seen exactly what you guys are doing. And, and just in chatting with you guys beforehand, I mean, the whole build from the engine, the transmission, and we're going to get to suspension here in a second, but just how you guys did all that it's just, it's so cool. And I know it's going to inspire a lot of people out there to tackle a project. And so, you know, leading into that suspension part of it, how did you guys approach that side? What, what were you guys looking for? What's, I mean, what's ultimately going to be the use for the truck? And I'm sure that factored into, Hey, how are we going to set up the suspension on? Let, let me go first on this one. So a little <laughs> bit about what you were saying before about, you know, the, the classiness of the truck. Yeah. This kind of goes in that category. So I won't bore everyone too much, but we are, we're third generation of a 59 year old manufacturing company. We work with uh, the Shinga Jitsu who are Japanese um, lean production gurus. So our whole life, my brothers and I, we've been learning all about lean manufacturing, which is just doing more with less and working with what you have and creating a product that's simple yet functional with the absolute highest quality you can possibly have. So. The whole idea behind this truck was to make it simple, functional, and the quality just be through the roof so that you can drive it, you can count on it, and you can trust it. Um, I myself go off on tangents, and I always want everything to be 100% billet. We have the machines to make everything billet, but he's always like, dude, it's it doesn't matter. We need this thing to work. We don't need it to look pretty. Like If we do all this billet stuff and we need to make another part, we're going to run into a huge problem. So, I mean, the billet stuff's badass. I absolutely love when people do all that stuff. But the whole idea has just been based off of those three categories, really. It's just simplicity, functionality, and quality. So the whole time, it's just been thinking about that and then just kind of going off on our own design point here, not doing the classic, you know, leaf spring set up in the front and leafs in the rear on a 97 Dodge chassis or something. Um, use that factory chassis that we have because we want the long, long bed. Get a badass set of TR beadlock wheels instead of some forged aluminum, uh, you know, American forces or something. Just do something that's different and, you know, fits the personality of the truck. Like this thing's going to be a mean Viking. It's got to be mean looking. It's got to have the right stance. It's got to look right. I don't know. I got ADHD. I hope I didn't go off too hard. <laughs> no, that was, that was perfect. And I think that strikes a lot of chords with, with diesel truck owners is I think that's why we gravitate towards them. We want that, that utmost quality and reliability and to see that transformed and yeah. not just the parts you're putting into it, but the whole approach to the build is really cool. Yeah. yeah. So what were you saying about suspension now? Sven will answer that uh, for you. Where did yeah. it stem from? So another reason why we had that passenger drop 
and it didn't bother us was because we were going to keep the uh, the front leaf springs, but we decided to do the coils. Um, I was talking to guys at Rough Stuff who, again, are super friendly, and they were kind of guiding us through the whole radius arm setup and, you know, how to go about doing it. And, and then they recommended me to go to um, ADS Shocks, Arizona, what is it, Desert Racing? Desert racing. Um, so they have racing shocks and I called them and this guy, Tyler answered the phone and helped us out a bunch. And he was like, yeah, you know, drive quality is going to be key. It's going to help a ton. So he kind of, uh, or all of those factors kind of pushed us into doing that radius arm setup. Um, we want to be able to get in the truck and drive it and be comfortable going down the road. Uh, New England roads are terrible. There's so many potholes, cracks, bumps, um, I know when I drive my 13 uh, Duramax and I get it, I can't stand getting in it to drive it. I daily drive it because every time <laughs> I hit a bump, even if it's a tiny crack, it makes all this noise, rattles and hops across the road. So uh, we don't we don't want this thing to be hopping across the road. Um, we just want to get in it and cruise and be comfortable. So that's kind of what pushed us to the um, the radius arm setup in the front and mm -hmm. the airbags in the back. And I think it's going to be mostly a like a towing rig so we want to get a, a gooseneck trailer for it um just to haul stuff yeah so the the purpose of it is just build a badass truck yeah. that we can drive but also that can work its ass off and and pull its weight you know put its money where its mouth is Definitely. that's a, that's another really cool part as well is actually being able to use these builds and yeah. you drive them have fun with it tow with it and right. Not be afraid to take it out, get it dirty, you know, put some weight behind it. Exactly. That's why we left the cab with the paint like that. So we don't really care about it. If it gets another dent, that's another story to tell. That was the part I wanted to ask you about next is, you know, with the build, what's coming up that you guys are, well, what are you guys working on right now? And then what, what's coming up next to work on it? Um, where are those brakes? Oh, you want to show them those yeah, brakes? Yeah, Max, grab those brakes, and then I'll grab you a shock, but I'll tell you what we're waiting for right now. So we have, <laughs> we're by, we're no experts by any means. This is the first time we've ever built a truck. So we can't do body work for crap. If I did body work, it would look like SpongeBob came along in here and, and played around <laughs> with some Play-Doh in there. So in the 58s, there's a weird gap above the windshield that rodents would crawl up the B pillar, A pillar, and hang out up there and you know party around and their feces caused it to rot out so all above our front windshield is rot that's the only rot on the truck oh, wow so we're waiting for our good buddy to come along and work his magic do some body work we have a few little cab corners that are all banged up from someone on the farm having too many beers or something and <laughs> the body works the biggest thing. It's funny that you were having this podcast now because we got a lot of our cool guy parts in. We got our brakes in and then we got our shocks in yesterday that we've been waiting for for a while. Um, but yeah, so what's coming up on the build? So well, like Lars said, or like you said, Patrick, we want to be able to drive this truck rain or shine. Uh, it probably won't go in the salt because we all know what that does to trucks. Oh, yeah. Um, but so, so the point of sealing up the cab is just so that we can drive it in the rain and not care. We want it to be sealed off and be comfortable driving in anything. But this is the brake. <laughs> so we're working on uh, right now is the brake setup. Like Lars said, we're not good with the body work, but um, I actually program CNC machines all day. Okay. Uh, so I've been trying to figure out a way to make a custom mounting bracket for this brake. Radio it's a, mount. Yeah, it's a massive six piston from uh, Willwood, and we got it custom painted orange. I don't know why orange. We thought it might pop with the green. We'll see. Uh, that is cool. But the interesting thing with this is that we have um, we have a dual rear wheel hub on the front axle. Um, like I said earlier, the '58 Viking uh, fender is super wide, so we wanted that dually hub, so our super single wheel would stick out but we don't want it sticking out uh like on a stretch wheel we want a tall and skinny tire flush with the fenders um and the only way to achieve that was with a nine and a half inch width uh tr beadlock four and a half inch backspace um, but the dually hub so in saying that with the dually hub our brake is sitting past um the back of the wheel 
and it looks terrible, honestly. From the front, you see your wheel, and then you see your brake pad, and then the caliper. It looks, I don't like the look. So um, <clears throat> what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this brake and push it into the wheel and make a custom bracket to mount it so we can hide it in the wheel. And also that's so you cool. can see it looking through the wheel. So that's up next. We got our shocks up next. And then we're working with um, Staz Works to try and get some custom dually wheels in the rear. Uh, and hopefully I can uh, custom machine those in-house to make a match our TRB block. So yeah. this is a TRX 6R six piston with eight or seven inches of pad area. Six and a half square inches. Six and a half square inches of pad area. It is a behemoth yeah, of a, a break. I mean, break. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm seven, like I said, and this thing is the size of my chest. So <laughs> oh, stopping this thing is going to be no problem. Oh, no. We doing, won't. Yeah, doing uh, break stands and uh, line lock. <laughs> I think we'll have like our own line lock here. This thing is so big. But the shocks are over there. Tyler just got those over to us. Yeah, Tyler from ADS, super helpful. We got them uh, all anodized black just to kind of make them pop inside that wheel well. I love the attention to detail. Like We, we yeah. talked about it a little bit before, but just all that you guys have put into this with the suspension, the the, the body itself, the engine, the, the brakes that you just showed us. Yeah. And, I mean, those shocks. <laughs> yeah, they're not massive shocks, like a 30-inch lift kit. Yeah. But like Sven said, we went with coilovers just because we want the ultimate ride quality and – ADS was super willing to work with us. Tyler answers the phone every single time we have a question and bug the crap out of them. Yeah. And I, that's the biggest thing too for us, Patrick. Like Lars said earlier, is, you know, we're an American manufacturer and our, our drive is quality and customer satisfaction. So um, I know our company, we don't have like a robot answering the phone. It's a person answering the phone who's going to transfer the call to another person who's going to help you out as soon as possible. Um, and it's all about the customer. So when I call, you know, uh, a company that does custom wheels and they say they can't help me get custom wheels, even though they say and tell their customers they're custom um, and they say they can't help me out, then that kind of upsets us. So my point is that, you know, we pick these companies to work with them because they're willing to help us out and they're willing to talk with us on the phone and, and, you know, help us understand, even though we, we might not be the expert in the industry. Um, and we might sound like a dumbass to them on the phone, but you know, they're there to help us learn and teach us. So that's kind of why we chose some of these brands to go with. That's a really good point. And, and something I, yeah. that I just popped you know, up as a question is, with your guys' professional experience, you know, being in, in your own industry and then jumping into this custom build, what has been your overall impression of the diesel industry and getting help and sourcing parts and people just wanting to, you know, maybe do something that's not part of a catalog or doesn't have a part number yeah. because this build is so custom? Yeah. Um, well, you want, you want our honest answer or what? Yeah, just give us the honest answer. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll go first and then Lars can give his portion because I know he'll probably give you a really heated answer. Um, so if someone call or if I call someone and they tell me, you know, three week lead time or three month lead time, I kind of, I get really pissed off because the competition, Amazon, China, you know, they're, they're the ones that are, are seeing that we can struggle with lead times like that. And they're saying, yeah. okay, fine, I can do this in a day. And I'll make the, I'll have this out in a day. Amazon shipping next day or shipping same day now, probably yep. delivery next day. Um, so a lot of the stuff in the diesel world, I get a lot of it's custom, but a lot of the times you, you get on the phone and you order something, you pay an excessive amount of money for something. And then they say, Oh yeah, it's a three week lead time. Oh, it's a six month lead time, whatever it might be. Um, I know for our customers, Major, I want to say 95% of the customers that call us, we're going to build the product either that day or the next day, depending on what time they order. And we're going to try to ship it out that next day. So we're big on, um, on returns and, and customer satisfaction, like I said. So, you know, when people say 
that that lead time i can't stand it it really gets me going because it's it's an area or it's an opportunity to improve um china's here it's knocking on our door for it to take our business away and, you know people complain about china taking business but then again they should look at their own process and say well i let them i let them take my business because i told my customer it's going to take three weeks to get the parts I don't want the part in three weeks. My mind can change in three weeks. I want the yeah. part now. You know what I mean? That's so a, that's a really good point. Yeah, that's kind of how I look at it. Um, lucky for the people that I buy parts from, I'm kind of patient. Um, <laughs> Lars is not patient. <laughs> yeah. No. So first things first. Long lead times does not mean you have the highest quality yeah, product. No, not we at were all. talking about this. It's like when you go to a restaurant. Your eyes are going to be drawn towards the one where there's a huge line and there's a long wait time, obviously. Yeah. So having that a uh, four month lead time does not mean you have the most badass part on the planet. I mean, give or take, yes and no, obviously. But these, I get so impatient. Like I said, I have ADHD, and I don't mean to start any fires with anyone, but I'm so used to people calling us and asking for something so crazy like a custom vibrating table that takes 40 hours to make. And we say, no problem coming right up. I'm so used to that, that when I call people in the diesel industry and they say, you know, it's going to be X amount of weeks. I'm like, I don't care. I, I, I want this now. Yeah. And like Sven said, America, all these guys making diesel parts in the United States. I love it. American manufacturers were the last ones here, but China's looking at us. Yeah. And they don't, they don't care. So the, that's yeah. point one. Point two, if anyone wants a custom truck built, you can call my courier. I'm just, <laughs> he's going to kill me. I, every time, every time he does something on Instagram, I say he's going to give away his truck for free or something, but no, um, custom truck side of it. We've listed the guys that have been absolutely amazing. Power driven diesel, Tyler, ADS, TR beadlocks, um, bunch of others but those are the ones that ring right off the top of my head but for building rough a custom stuff. rough stuff oh yeah those guys are great but for building a custom truck god youtube yeah and what's that book we got that four link book oh uh, i don't know oh there's this book this four link book that's absolutely amazing um, if sven wasn't a brilliant engineer i'd probably read it <laughs> Um, i'll have to find it and send it to you patrick and then you can put it in the link or something or in okay. the description yeah, I don't know, Patrick, but for building a custom truck, I think it's just you got to want it. You got to want to do it. You got to want to spend the time to watch the videos. You got to want to want to spend the time to understand it. Yeah, you have to understand it and understand the process of it. What's happening? You know what? If you do this, what it's going to affect. And if you don't do this, what's it not going to affect? That kind of thing. And I'm not going to lie. It's not easy. We've been doing this for three <laughs> years. And we only do it on the weekends, as you know, and everyone already knows, we have day jobs. So we're here Saturday and Sunday all day. That's it. So if I think if we can do it, we may have a little cheat code because we have access to the machines and material. But I think if, if we can do it, anyone else can do it. And no one ever, whenever we talk about a really cool build like this one that you guys have, is we'll get an influx of messages and people say, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And they ask those questions like, hey, how do I tackle this? Where do I find the information? And a lot of times they're not, they're not in the diesel industry or they haven't worked around it. And I'm always curious what people in other industries think about it because it's changed a lot from five years ago, 10 years ago. I mean, if, if um, you know, how you order parts and how quickly things are done. And I think it's great to put pressure on these companies and on the culture, because you're right. It, there are other places where they're pushing hard and the quicker we can get, I don't know if we'll ever achieve, Amazon type service, same day service, but it doesn't mean we can't shoot for it and get it quicker. And, yeah. and I think yeah. that's, what's going to bring more people in and get more of these builds done. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and the, that turnaround time, I'm not really talking about custom trucks either. It's mostly just parts that make the trucks. Um, but yeah, agreed. Uh, Amazon status is, is pretty high on the list. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing, but again, they're just a uh, they're just a middleman, so it's not like they're actually making the stuff either. You know what I mean? They yeah. just have massive warehouses, but they're Patrick. They're setting the standard for the industry. So if 
if you can't get a product on Amazon and have it at your door next day, then you are already losing. Yeah. The point is, is how do you supply that Amazon so that Amazon can resell it that quick? Um, you know, a, a lot of our stuff, we do OEM. Um, and when we lose out on OEM, we lose out in the long term because let's say you buy a, a, um, a one of our pieces of equipment um, or sorry, let's say you buy like a sander for a truck for your diesel truck and it comes with a vibrator and that vibrator breaks. You're not going to call me, the manufacturer, the um, another vibrator manufacturer. You're going to call the manufacturer that made that vibrator yeah. for replacement parts, whatever. Uh, so you got to be able to respond in that sense as well. And that really goes back into diesel parts too. Like yeah. if, if I buy a Hamilton head from somewhere, I mean a Hamilton cam from somewhere, I'm probably going to call Hamilton before yeah. I call the distributor that I bought it from. Right. If it broke. Right. What are you guys shooting for to, for a timeline to have the truck ready roadworthy, <laughs> taking it out, hauling stuff. I called our friend Mike the other day and told Sven that next year I really want to take this truck to Lone Star Throwdown. That'll be cool. Oh yeah, our buddy Mike just bought a nice Mac, uh, old, like a really nice old Mac. So <laughs> that, that's what I said. So hopefully we can we, make that we happen. Want him, we want him to haul it with his Mac. <laughs> Not only do we like big diesel trucks, but we also really like '80s C10s. <laughs> And slammed C10s and stuff like that. So I'd like to have it done for Lone Star Throwdown. That'd be pretty cool. That's a that's a huge event and it's it's so popular. And There's so many cool things. Yeah, driving it down there. Drive it yeah. to Lone Star Throwdown. That's cool. Well, I um like I said before, this build is so awesome. And I think it's the way you guys have approached it and I can't wait to see it out there driving, see some videos <laughs> and everything. So for anyone that's you know, either listening or, or watching on YouTube, if they want to check out the pictures and things you guys have done, what's the best place to see this build? Um, we have a YouTube channel, yeah. but we're not videographers. That's Viking brothers garage. Uh, yeah. Viking yeah. brothers garage. And then we Instagram, all three of us are on it all the time. Uh, which is 58 underscore Chevy underscore Viking. And we all, we check the, the DMs, the, uh, the requested DMs all the time. So if anyone ever has any questions, we love to help as much as possible. It's spreading the knowledge is yeah. our goal. Well, yeah, it's a community. So and and I like definitely... I said, when, when you can't get help, it sucks. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I definitely appreciate you guys when you reached out and just sharing and chatting before the podcast and telling me about it, what your goals were, and then sitting down, you know, after work today, a busy day and yeah. sharing this all with us and setting up everything so we can see the build. My eyes keep going over to it the whole time and I'm looking yeah. at parts and, and everything else, but definitely keep me updated on it. Let me know when it's, it's ready. I want to yeah. check it out and I appreciate your time and, and the approach you guys definitely. are taking to this. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It was a pleasure, Patrick. We'll definitely stay in touch with you. So we're stoked to be on here. I mean, I hope we talked about the build a little bit. I'm trying to think about it if we did. Yeah, hopefully we made sense. Like Lars said, we're both ADD, so sometimes we lose track of what we're saying. Oh, just jump any in. other questions, you can message us, and maybe I'll even give you my little brother's phone number. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, Diesel fans, if there's any builds you guys are working on, questions you have about parts or any guests you'd like to have on the podcast, the best way to let us know that is to send us a direct mess message on Instagram. Just search at the diesel podcast. We check those messages all the time. Just let us know who you'd like to have on the questions you'd like us to ask, and we'll do our best to get them on, on there as well. And also if you, we're going to be doing something new. So with all the guests we chat with, we're going to be sitting down and doing zoom calls with them and getting video and being able to see the parts in the truck. So if you guys want to see that, we encourage you to follow us on YouTube. Just search the diesel podcast. You'll see all 300 plus of our videos. And, you know, starting with this, this episode and moving forward, we're going to have videos for all of them. So if there's any suggestions and any people we, you know, should chat with any, any really cool builds or parts or anything like that. Definitely let us know. You can leave us a comment on any of the videos and we'll reach out to you and follow up until next time. Keep the shiny side up.